and thanks for joining us on your channel of choice africa independent television ait and let me welcome you to the signature show my name is mabuz njoko and in this edition of the program oil theft fuel subsidy and the unenviable position of the npc united nations says nigeria's out of school children now going to 20 million as mass hunger sends more Nigerians into petty crimes. Nigerian politics of what use are big names to political parties. Nigeria police promotes corruption to the icon. Plus, our thank you and sweeper. We keep our promise of an exciting time every Sunday. Just stay with us. <laughs> Now, the challenge of crude oil theft has become a national embarrassment because federal government officials at the highest level admit that there is a crude oil theft bazaar taking place in Nigeria. They focus in the media on this very challenge, which has effectively dried up Nigeria's revenue, has been on those who break crude oil pipelines to steal crude for illegal refining in the creeks. However, these pipeline breakers and illegal refiners are small fries in the massive oil theft scheme killing Nigeria. If you doubt this, then please follow the mathematics by the chief of naval staff, Anwar Zuber, in a recent television interview. According to the naval chief, some of the ships Carrying illegal crude for Nigeria had capacity of 15,800,000 liters of li crude. For a light badge, the type used by oil thieves to fill that ship would take 3,160 trips in one day. Secondly, some arrested ships are without loading documents. Would documents are then forwarded by an NPC to effect the release of the arrested ships? The question is. Who issued the documents for loading of crude? An NPC. Who allowed the ships to load without documents and then produce documents after the ships have been arrested? An NPC. The NNPC and international oil companies operating in Nigeria must produce answer to Nigeria's crude oil theft challenge. Already, the consequences of dried up revenue are here. Nigeria's deficit in the 2023 budget is put as high as 14.6 trillion naira. In addition to oil theft challenge, is the fuel subsidy challenge. The Minister of Finance, Hanab Ahmed, says the subsidy is no longer sustainable. And the customs boss, Colonel Hamidi Ali, says the volume of petrol quoted by NNPC as daily consumption based on which subsidy is being claimed cannot be correct. In other words, Nigeria is paying subsidy to make some people smile all the way to the banks while many families go hungry. And talking about hungry families, statistics by the National Bureau of Statistics are not cheering. As inflation is heading towards the 20% mark, food prices are driving many more families into hunger. And this is the issue taken up by correspondent Nasir Usman in this special report. Nigeria's food import bills do not seem to be dropping with the collapse of the value of the Nigerian currency against the dollar. Prices of imported items including food become out of the reach of many Nigerians. The National Bureau of Statistics is also reporting that prices of local food items are increasing every day and the Food and Agriculture Organization is forecasting a gloomy prospect for Nigeria's agriculture sector. By now, the plant is supposed to go down because this is the season. This is the price is supposed to go down. But now, look at it. When I reach that place, they add money as if we are doing another thing in the market. Then I come out from that place. I went to the place that I bought the yam. When you get there, it's like there is riot. Everywhere, one quarter of yam, they are calling 150, 120, very small yam, very small yam. 
Are you sure? I don't know where we are going to. The price of this has actually increased. In fact, the price of this are like times 10 of what we usually get. Yes, because everything now is times 10. It has increased. So we are just managing. Everybody is managing right now. We are just pleading for federal government to do something about it. So they should do something about it. So the masses are dying. We are suffering. The organization sees poor land management, among other factors, account for the very low productivity in Nigeria's agricultural sector. The high cost and very low agricultural output means that many more Nigerian families go hungry every day. So Nigeria is heavily endowed when we talk about land and land resources. But the problem that we usually have is in terms of the utilization and also understanding of its management. Uh, because it's very, very necessary for us to consider what purpose land can stand in for. And, uh, you know, use it for that particular purpose. Because if not, you are only going to start, you know, something that will not be sustainable. You know, whenever you are going into farming, you have to know a different crop have their own different, have different soils that they, that they grow under optimally. Okay. So, you know, these farmers, these farmers, they like this knowledge. They like this knowledge. When, so this, this is where the agricultural economics and extension comes to play. They have to what they have they have to what, disseminate this information to the farmers in such a way that they they can they can they can educate them on how to attain this maximum productivity. As the Nigerian government seems perplexed about the high cost of food items, and as local agencies and international organizations predict spreading poverty in the country, the government's efforts to increase agricultural output are being thwarted by insecurity across the country. Farmers are being killed by terrorists, abducted by ransom-seeking bandits and losing their animals to rustlers. On November 28, 2020, 44 farmers were killed in Borno State in one day by Boko Haram insurgents. Just last week, a whole farming community in Castina State was overrun by criminal bandits who have converted them to slave, farming and harvesting crops for the bandits. According to the Nigerian security tracker, 352 farmers have been killed and kidnapped in the last 12 months. In Benue, Plateau and Kaduna states, whole farming communities have either been wiped off by marauding elders or their crops destroyed. In consequence, farmers are abandoning their farms and elders are turning to crime to seek revenge against a situation that is making many of them unemployed and destitute. Their actions compound the situation. Uh, the government should also look towards um, uh, investing in terms of, um, you know, uh, good policies, good poly policies, sorry, that will, uh, in other words, improve agriculture. So we, we need to look into all these things. They are a little bit complicated, but they are all intertwined. So one thing leads to the other. We can actually attain food security for real, but we cannot do that without getting, first of all, um, security in our environment. So the issue of what is security actually this this is a serious problem that need to be addressed by the government. You know? Like the, the one the farmers alone can't can't address the issue of insecurity. Majorly, you know, like people in like as if of the not understand being the major producer of what food items in Nigeria. Well if we if we address this issue of insecurity, we can we can what at a maximum productivity, and we can even export what we want to produce to the outside world. The prospect for any improvement in 2023 does not appear bright. Just last week, while presenting the medium term expenditure framework and strategy reports, the Minister of Finance Zainab Ahmed painted the picture of a Nigerian economy about to go on its knees. The national budget deficit will be in excess of 11 trillion naira. The minister then hit a nail on the coffin of any hope for struggling Nigerian families. She said that there may not be capital projects in 2023, a clear indication that money injected into the economy through massive construction and capital expenses of government will no longer be available. This will translate to more unemployed people, less money for the farmers and greater hunger for many families. The federal government 2023 aggregate expenditure is projected to be 19.76 trillion, 
This is inclusive of government-owned enterprises. In this scenario, the budget deficit is projected to be 11.30 trillion in 2023. This is up from 7.35 trillion in 2022. This represents 5.01 percent of the estimated GDP above the 3 percent threshold as stipulated in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Today, burglaries are on the increase across cities and communities in Nigeria. Many more Nigerians shown on pride to pick through a waste and leftovers from local restaurants and Nigerians beggars as scavengers population is on the increase. Let's assume there is adequate employment. This issue of banditry and insecurity will reduce because 80% of those that are perpetrating this evil act, they are youth, though we are not certain if they are Nigerians or not. But we can we cannot tell. We never can tell we never can tell their nationality. And we cannot hundred percent conclude that Nigerians are not part of them. As families get caught in the web of mass hunger, many more members get depressed, become psychotic and roam the streets for those who resort to crimes like burglary, thiefery, breaks in and shoplifting. The law catches up and the police charge them with the crime. These cases put the court in a dilemma. Can the blind lady really remain blind and allow a sword to come down when those arraigned before the court are not acquitted of their crime? But a government that has lost grip on a doubting food crisis that may turn Nigerians against themselves in desperation to survive. In Abuja, Nasir Usman for Signature Show. Now, last week, the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, unveiled Nigeria's medium-term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy document. The document has not just generated considerable agitation because of the gloomy financial and general economic gloom it pens. It has also generated controversy about how well thought out the document is. In our conversation this Sunday, a development economist and financial strategist, Professor Gordon Owo, gives us maybe greater insight into the document. Please stay with us. Prof, you're welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Prof, I, I, I'm a layman, and so let me start from the layman's perspective. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the minister said was that we're going to run a deficit of close to 12.42 trillion. We're going to borrow and we're going to sell some national assets. To, to me, an ordinary person, that looks frightening. Sell some national assets. Let me begin from there. Does Nigeria have the local capital, Nigerian, Nigerians who have got the big money to buy these assets that can give the federal government enough to offset some of its deficit? Or are we going to throw it open? Or should we throw it open to international investors? Yes. Um, you see, this, this question is critical. It has been ongoing. And uh, luckily, it has come to a stage now where the government had made a definite pronouncement that uh, they actually intend to sell national assets once more under privatization. Now, the, the, the previous experience of privatization had not shown any desired results, any concrete results in terms of accountability for the resources, in terms of the outcome and the measurements to ensure that the expected outcome prima facie were met. The most recent is the power privatization. You can see that uh, it, 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 there's no result coming from there. Uh, but the law, my worry is the, 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 the legal position as provided in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. By section 53 of that act, sale of public assets is actually prohibited, except where it is being sold in exercise of a legal lien. That is, an asset had been pledged, 
and the, the, the liability matures, then you have to sell the assets to pay off the liability. Otherwise, there is a clear provision of sale of government assets by virtue of provision of Section 53 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. That is one. Two, uh, you can see a major contradiction in the proposal of the minister because I expect it to be a proposal. Because again, Section 13.2 of Part 2 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act also provides for a public dissemination of the medium-term expenditure framework and the corresponding fiscal strategy paper before it is promulgated. And I think the, the, the minister is going through a process of perhaps getting the two arms of the National Assembly to approve it. But before then, there ought to be an extensive public presentation in form of a draft, an exposure draft, wherein discussions will have come in, wherein insights must have been pointed before decisions are taken. But what we are seeing is uh, a, 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 a procedure. It's kind of a foot accompany. Yes, that has not gone through the process because the professionals have not seen very critical professional debate, have not seen sectorial inputs, I have not, at this stage, that is critical. So, uh, perhaps it's a fait accompli where, wherein we, we should start talking once it's done. And one, when it's done, that usual phrase of no going back will come into it. So, my position straight away there is that there's a legal issue there. Two, economically, it's not viable because it, it will merely create excessive rent seeking plus agency costs. Once that happens, there's no way you expect a, a, a good result from there. So, usually, assets, national assets are kept as a buffer, as a future hedge against liquidity problem for the oncoming generation. You cannot be selling assets when you have recorded a very high level of national debt, which is going to be paid by oncoming generation. So, and the timing is bad. We're in a transition period. Election is coming up. Under one year now, there will be a change of government. So, the, I think the focus should have been an MTEF and FSP that focuses on transition. You cannot be selling assets to worsen the situation of a fragile economy that has recorded complete market failure. When you do that, is uh, in fact the situation will be too bad, and nobody, nobody, nobody expects any macroeconomic stability under that situation. Nobody expects a competitive market under that situation. Then nobody expects any incentive for any foreign investment. So the idea of even the sale of assets attracting genuine foreign investors is ruled out. Or is it attracting genuine value uh, is is ruled out. And where is the liquidity base? The Naira is comatose, and the, the, the dollar coming in now, why the dollar is depreciating against major yeah. currencies, is appreciating geometrically against the Naira. Naira. So what do you think? Uh, Prof, I'm looking at the figures reeled out by the minister. Let me just take the deficits, which I mentioned earlier, 12.42 trillion. Doesn't it sound commonsensical that you use what you have to get what you need? If we're as low as 12.46 trillion, how else will the country make the money if not using what it has? Let's sell off some, some of these things now, make the money to offset this deficit. No, you see, the, the, the point is you can, all of us, as we are sitting here, we can have the appetite of acquiring private jets, yes. instead of going with our little, little vehicles. So appetites must be related to the capacity of the resources you have. Otherwise, there's no discipline. Why do we talk of fiscal discipline? Why do we talk of technical capacity to transform whatever you have into values that are over and above its nominal value? There is no way anybody cannot borrow to sustain a very high level of uh, lifestyle. But you come down to the level of resources you can generate. 
Why is that deficit not 60 uh, 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 trillion even? Why are they stopping at 12? Is that where deficit ends? You cannot be talking of increased deficit when you are not emphasizing the area for capital investments because it is in the area of capital investment with positive cash flow projections that will be able to pay back the capital plus the costs. Otherwise, you are simply increasing the, 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 the rentier space for officials that manage that resource such that while they will be enjoying very high level of personal surpluses, the system, the economy, will be enjoying very terrible no, deficits. Let us simplify this. That's the, the point. The, the, let us simplify it. Isn't yes. it that this would encourage corruption? Of course, that is what it is. Because the entire deficit is pointing to the fact that the managers, those who are in charge, will be benefiting, profiting, while the, the, the nation itself, and coming to the real issue now, the real common man, the household, will be suffering. Because there is no component of aspects of the MSP that is targeting employment, that is targeting functional production, functional production for the economy, that is targeting good governance that will now create welfare and development, which will sustain strong and reliable growth in the economy. Let me share your fear in this along these lines. The minister says that she painted the scenario that there could be a situation where there will be no capital project in 2023. And you know that it is government expenditure that seems to reflect, drive the economy, especially in construction. When money is released for major projects in construction, that's a spin-off. Employment. Small businesses grow. When there have been no capital project in 2023, isn't that a doomsday? Yeah, I think uh, she, she created two scenarios. She did? Yes. Now, the, the, uh, uh, in, in terms of, she said, treasury finance capital project. Projects. That is no direct. Now, they can take loan. They will take loan directly. But experience have not shown any serious outcome because of the, 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 the no monitor the monitoring space is zero but then that brings me to section 25 of the same fiscal responsibility act because the, the entire idea of the framework of the budget is hinged on, on, that, on act. that act 2007 that act requires the minister to also provide an attendant cash plan for the budget that is where we have seen the exact, the exact line items of what those uh, loan targeted projects are. But it's not available. Now, Section 26 further now requires the Accountant General to show a disbursement plan that should support the budget. These two very important documents are not there. They are not part of the projections. Because that is where we have seen, we have seen the exact projects that will be financed so that you can now test the ability to yield cash flow. Then you see the timing of repayments. Then you have also seen the brought forward projects and how such, what we're having now. No. And again, that takes us to their, their, their own presumption of what contingency liability is. It's totally wrong, surprisingly. What the, the ministry did was just to collect an economic document, an economic document from the DMO, which is different from the real meaning of contingent liability in this context. And that is why the government keep running into trouble. Simply put, contingency liabilities are liabilities that are arising out of maybe negotiations, MOUs, certain contracts which you have not formalized but which may mature, like the ASU negotiations or labor negotiations, a possible litigation cost that may arise, you state them and state the likely amount that should occur. Contingent, they could mature. What, how, how are you containing it? Because these are things that brings very heavy shock to governments. 
And that was what had brought the public university system to its knees. Because the government over the years will not accurately measure its own contingent liabilities and provide for it. They will forget that a lot of agreements have been reached by a lot of people. All of a sudden, somebody will just appear and say, ah, Mr. President, you have to pay us uh, 50 billion. We signed it for we Problem starts. You now say, no, you have to renegotiate and all that. That is the problem. That same issue is being repeated now. Because this FSP is supposed to clearly show us the possible contingent liability that could arise in resolving this issue problem. It's not there. The health issues we are facing. It's not there. The contingency plans that we should go into to upscale production in agriculture so that the shocks arising therein will be reduced. These are the problems. So the, 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 the question of what the government should do regarding uh, uh, capital projects cannot even come in because the, the control system is very weak. That, is, that should be central. Now, I want to ask you directly. Can and should, can and should Nigeria retain subsidy, consumption subsidy on anything, including petrol, in a circumstance? Yes, yeah, you see, uh, if the regime of accountability is right, there is no government that operates without subsidy. And subsidy, the counterfactual of subsidy, is actually that the, gov the impact of governance welfare and development is directly being felt by the citizen, by the real household. And it's usually an, a means of reducing inequality. That is the gap between the rich and the poor. Because all of them, both sides, affects the quality and standard of the economy, the life in the economy. Therefore, subsidy is one of the best drivers of development. If it's properly measured, Prof. But if. here, Thank yes, you. here. The history of if that is in the problem. Here, subsidy has become a source of direct diversion of public resources into private hands by those who are involved in the management. Today, once you see somebody with money that you can't account for so big, oh, it's an oil magnet. Where is where is he magneting the oil? How? Where? That's the problem. So it has become a direct source of corruption, massive stripping of national resources into those who manage the economy. And that leads you to one simple thing. If you want to check an empirical control of that, if you can please go to BA, early morning BA in Abuja, you will see the same set of people in circles of one one week going to going in and out to go with which resources. Yeah, this people cannot show you a farm where they produce one tuba of yam, one tuba of anything. In other words, they deal in cash. Cash that have missed the track. In the system. In the system. Cash that is coming out of a very vicious circle within the economy. And it, starts, it continues becoming vicious. And that is why when government comes out to ad admit that, oh, subsidy has to be removed. This one, No, that is not where the problem is. By the time you remove subsidy and you have not addressed the fundamental channels through which the siphoning goes, it will develop from another, it will develop from another angle. That's the problem. I have not seen very serious efforts being made at reducing the cost of governance. Reducing the parasites that goes to those who manage the economy. And that is why the cost of competing for political office is so, is so high. So subsidy is not the problem. The problem is improper measurement and deliberate less affair attitude towards effective control. Because, you see, when you talk of subsidy, the economic underpinning of subsidy is that a particular product has a market price that will sustain the producer. But between that market price 
and what sustains the producer, the government has to pay a proportion so that the producer will be making his normal margin. But then the consumers, the people, will also be enjoying a lower price that will increase their livelihood so that they can sustain their life with very little income. My question here is, with the entire document that the minister has presented before the public, do you find anything in that document? If you don't, if you do, let us see it. If you don't, let us see it. And what can we do to get out of it? Well, uh, on the surface, every budget proposal is uh, supposed to improve the status quo. So on that note, we believe that the proposal will improve the status quo. But the big but there is that uh, because it's a transitional budget, the MPEF and the FSP is supposed to have shown that it's lacking. It's lacking because uh, certain segments, certain sectors, uh, I do not even feel that the, with the recent reawakening of youths in political awareness, that the government may even be interested in their welfare. Because that issue of we and them mentality normally over, override normal, neutral, and objective consideration of welfare. So uh, uh, with that, maybe as a result of further interventions, the, the government need to sit right back and readdress the issue of poverty, especially youth unemployment. Prof, thank you for, very much for coming to the show. Thank you very much. My name remains more voice in Jock who let the conversation continue. Good afternoon. Well, it is the season of politics, and each season produces its own drama. And in the current season, it is Emilokon. And these children will make you lose election. It is the season of movement by some big names within the Nigerian political space. Sure, everywhere in the world, big names count in politics, and that is why candidates and their political parties count on big names to impress the electorate. But what manner of big names make electoral impact? And how should big names emerge in politics? Through founding parties? Or through working for measurable good of the people? Through having deep pockets? Or through being counted on the side of the people? This is the story told this Sunday by correspondent Marvelous Obomano. The history of Nigerian politics has prominent place for big names. Great Zeke of Africa, the Saldana of Sokoto, Sir Amadou Bello, Chief Obafemi Awolowo. These big names are, however, consequences and not causes. They are the consequence of a commitment to a struggle to move Nigeria from being a people responsible to a foreign and absentee sovereign to a people responsible to themselves and their indigenous leadership. They are the consequence of committing to moving their people away from being treated as an extractive industry to being accountable to a local authority that takes power in order to care. It is the people who made them big and because of the people they got mandate. In the north, they have people they respect. In the west, they have people they respect. Likewise in the south. You know? So that's why if you see people like uh, Maybe somebody like uh, Governor Wiki or uh, even uh, uh, people like Obasanjo, IBB, and the rest of them. And those people, you can't, you can't wish them away. They still have influence in this country. But at the same time, uh, they also know that the people matter. And if you, if you look at the recent uh, election so far, you can see that the people's voice is becoming more powerful than even individuals. 
you know, like the, how, what happened in the Northern states. Uh, even an incumbent governor that has all the state resources was defeated. Who wins elections in Nigeria today? What makes political parties in Nigeria strong today? If you want the answers, then look towards the political parties. In 2014, a herd of big names broke away from the People's Democratic Party, joined big names from other political parties to form the All Progressives Congress, APC. Why did these big names come together and to what were they committed? Power must return to the North. In other words, the personal interest of the big names, power. Again, in the run-up to the 2023 general elections, the big names are popping up. In the past, a few people would come together, those with heavy economic powers, you know. Uh, funny enough, these are people who are living large on the strength of uh, uh, what they have helped themselves with when they had the opportunity of uh, leading the country in various capacities in the past, you know. You understand? But I don't yeah, want to come yeah, out yeah, directly to yeah, say yeah, these yeah, are people yeah, who are yeah, yeah. stolen our money and all of that. But the truth is that uh, uh, they have, you know, financial muscle to determine who leads at every level. Uh, it has been a small group, you know, of kingmakers. Uh, the people are on one side with their PDCs. Then a few people come together to say, "Ah, the next president of Nigeria is uh, Dr. Abu Mejo and all of that." The River State Governor Yesu Wiki has become implacable. He holds his party, People's Democratic Party, guilty of committing an unpardonable sin of denying him access to power. But he is a big name. He is committed to funding the party. He is committed to even sharing of opportunities accruing from grabbing power. Where do the people feature? In Wiki's big name status, when you're looking for something, you need to look. You need not to like, uh, uh, like, wave aside anybody. You have to welcome everybody, whether the person is useless or useful. You have to welcome the person because you need that power. By the time you get that power, you can now say, okay, maybe this person is important or is not important. But as it is right now, politicians are looking for any any uh, big name or any gladiator that can swear vote to this, to this or influence votes. People like Wiki in the South South, he has a, a lot of uh, control over the uh, political structures in, uh, in other states in South South, in River State especially. So he can wish away those votes. So anybody that would influence votes or mobilize votes or mobilize voters for you, you have to uh, bring the person to the table. Last week, the big names went to London holding meetings. Olushegu Obasanjo, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Atiku Abubakar, Samuel Otom. What warranted their meetings and why did the meetings become a national issue? Was it because of a commitment to the people and their welfare, moving away from making Nigeria an extractive industry so that the people can feel the impact of governance? No. It was because the big names were considering how to relate in order to take power. So, where does the people's interest determine when and who becomes the big name? Again, last week, Ibrahim Shakaral returned to the People's Democratic Party, a party from which he defected to the new Nigeria's People's Party, NMPP. PDP celebrated because a big name had returned to their fold. But because of who should a party roll out the drums? Again, as Nigerians bemoan the state of their nation and life becomes less rewarding, should the list of big names in Nigeria be getting shorter or longer? The power to choose who leads at whatever level is now, you know, gradually shifted to the people because now as we speak, it is you your PVC, the beaver's machine, and then the results. Okay. So the power to elect, the power to determine who leads at any level now is gradually shifting to the people. And I can tell you that uh, 
uh, at the end of uh, the 2023 general election. I'm not saying we're going to have it quite perfect in 2023, but at the end of 2023, the direction will be very clear to Nigeria. So 2027, the people would have taken over to themselves, the ordinary people, the absolute powers to determine who leads them. In those developed democracies like that of the US, those who determine who rules them, who are the political capitalists, they don't exercise those rights or those privileges to their own personal advantage. They exercise those privileges to the advantage of the ordinary people. The reverse is what we have in Africa, especially in the case of Nigeria. The failure of governance in Nigeria is the failure of individual personalities in Nigerian politics. To have the list of big names elongating in the face of an increasingly impoverished population is a contradiction, and to celebrate the coming of some big names into political parties is to admit that Nigerians are yet to establish why a political party should win an election. Marvelous, a bombman for the signature show. And now for our thank you and sweeper. Now at almost 30, she has become a woman of course, mature in growth, mature in mind, and mature in music. But she started out as a child music lover at two years old. With a freestyle that stands her music image as adventurous, Teniola Akpata has carved a niche for herself with many works including Faragi, Wait, Bareke, Askemaya, and The Monster, Bilonia. It is our sweeper for this Sunday. Wanna make love on the moon Dancing to my tunes Is it too much? It's not too much I wanna be a forest If wishes were horses Is it too much? It's not too much If I want money me I do a dance I got this dance If I want money me I'm all by my ishoto, I'm all by my ifoya, I'm all by me. Yeah, hey, yeah, I wanna be a billionaire, billionaire, yeah, yeah. I wanna be a billionaire, billionaire, yeah, yeah.
Well, that's our package for this edition of the program. But please remember, can you remember the story of DSP Mike Obokun? The police officer who does not accept bribe, does not allow payment for bail, and prefers to settle parties in any dispute. He was honored as anti-corruption icon and soldier by corruption theory. Well, the police authorities have promoted him for diligence. And we thank the Inspector General of Police and the Nassau State Commissioner of Police for this gesture of professional encouragement. And we bring back the story of DSP Michael Boko this Sunday as we join my colleague, Marvelous Obomano, for Corruption Theory. Please stay with us. I'm Wabuzin Joko. Good afternoon. My country people, we don't carry another Tory come this Sunday. This na corruption Tory time. Na me be your corruption Tory master, marvelous Oboman. On a welcome. I know say last week some people clap, some shout, some say ah to be better person no mean say you must be an imam. Or a pastor. The story of Modesta of Fobike, where we carry come last Sunday, it makes sense. It touched the heart. And that one tell you, say, my brother, my sister, good thing, good. This week, we get another story where we go show, say, in many places, in many jobs, Nigerians day where they make sacrifice, where they show, say, the noise about corruption. Again, Nigerians when go put their hand inside them, no matter how they, they take suffer rich. Naim be our Tori this Sunday. This is a corruption Tori. You know be saying a lie. You know say when goats when they chop yam, begin waka with another goat where they chop yam. Himself go begin to chop yam. But he get goat where be say, no matter, no matter how he take be, them no go greet chop yam. This na the Tori of one policeman where they for one police post. New Karu police post where they for Nasrawa State. As we finish corruption story, talk your own, make I talk my own. Where Oyibo they call town hall meeting from Pape where they for Abuja. And as we can show the town hall for corruption story program, some people, market women, Okada Union, and cultural association come gather themselves. Come tell us for corruption story. Say, he get one policeman where be like say, inside marriage register with poverty. Hmm. But why they come talk the, about this man like this now? Nah? First, the man named na DSP Mike Oboku, na him they in charge of new Karu police post. As Ogawe him be, he can do and undo. But DSP Mike Oboku no even get Okada. Some of his officers get to, but this man no they allow anybody pay any bribe for his station. For DSP Mike Oboku, that thing where they write, police is your friend. The man they take him serious. Don't pay for bail. The man no they take him play. So corruption to go find DSP Mike Oboku after we don't write the Nasarawa State Commission of Police to give DSP Mike Oboku two awards, anti-corruption icon and anti-corruption soldier. On behalf of Corruption to with support of MacArthur Foundation, representing this to you, um, in recognition of the outstanding efforts in the fight against corruption. Congratulations. 
The Oga of Work for Corruption Tory, where be chief Umwabwe Zenjoko, come talk say waiting make corruption Tory, come find the SP Mike Oboku, now make others learn, say if you do good thing, good thing go find you come, even if you be like say things they had. Again, not in the sweet pass, thank you. The story of Nigeria, what we read very quickly in about Nigeria is, they are corrupt, they are corrupt. If you go to Ibo, BBC, Nigeria corrupt. You go to VOA, Nigeria corrupt. Even ourselves, we ourselves, sometimes we say we are corrupt. It is how you tell your story that people will tell it for you. So we decided that every year we must identify one Nigeria in public service, in important service, where there's a lot of temptation and still the person resists doing the wrong things. Before we found you, I didn't know you. It was community people. These market women, all these pharmacy people, say, give me, give us a policeman whom you think. That was, that's the first I got to know you. So it is your activity and the image you are making for the police, not for yourself, that made us come here today. We work with Makato Foundation of USA. They are our partners and sponsors. And that is why on behalf of Makato Foundation and Signature TV. As we go new Karu Police Division, now so many, many friends and officers where they work with the SP Michael Boku come gather to rejoice with Michael Boku for the good thing we don't happen to them. Come see what they talk about officer with corruption to re honor. DSP Mike Akubo is a very nice man, a kind of man that listens to people to solve their problem, to entertain them. Time of issues, you bring complaint, he will listen to you very well and he will solve the problem. And he's a man that he needs straightforward if you are working with him tell him the truth you have problem come up and explain time of issue like that he will address you people how to come up with case if there is case he will tell you what to do and he will address the issue very well it's a man that don't take side he's always speaking truth listening to the parties he will give you your own he will give you your own so he's a man that's always good with people he's a man that always interrupt with everyone working with him he's a nice man i want to thank you people for the award and i know him i'm a business lady i come here to sell markets and from the time I've spent with him, he's a good man. I'm not a police officer, like I told you before, I'm a business lady. And is what I see, I can tell you. I don't really know much deeply, but my interaction with him, sometimes he's a nice man. Not all eggs that are bad. There is one particular, there are other ones that make one bad. But I want to tell you, you know, everybody's character is different. His character, he's a very nice man. He don't, he don't get into my staying with him, my interaction and my, my observation. He don't get into bribing. He do, if he's handling a case, he do justice to that. One of the SP Mike Oboku friend will be retired ASP Elias Danjuma. Come talk say, as him heart, they happy for him friend with them award. Mm. He no go kukuma mind to marry the SP Mike Oboku. Ha. But the challenge na say, Oboku na man. And a marriage uh, plan, you know, go fee work. Well, Mark uh, DSP Mark Oboku is my brother, is my friend, is my colleague. We work together, and uh, since I knew him, he's he's a different person. Mark Oboku is a different person. Is that in the issue of corrupt? No. Is zero. Mark is a good man. In fact, 
if I'm a woman I'll say I'll marry him. I imparted me a lot. Because I know the sky is his limit. Because it's imparted a lot. And uh, I'm happy too. Those junior ones that are working under him, they will sit up. Because that is always, anytime that he lecture them, always tell them they should sense corrosion. Corrosion is not good. So I'm happy for the award that people are giving to him. I have been, I have seen him that he will get it more. Thank you. Mike Oboku, where corruption to re-give the award, come talk say, the award where corruption to re-give him. Go make and they do more work, put in hand straight, without any magu magu. I never knew that it resulted to this. So, I'm very happy over it. Oh, no, I'm not different from others. So, you see, the, the problem is that I don't have much comment to make. Hmm? Only we give thanks to God eh, for placing me in this position. And this award, I only dedicated it to my DPO and my staff. That is all, all I have to say. In fact, uh, I'm, I've never known them before. I've never known the, uh, the foundation before. They got to surprise me when I got to know them, when they approached me. This was what is happening, this was happening. So I have to take it with good faith. This a corruption theory. Hmm. If you like say police don't they change everywhere oh ha people go ask now Nigerian police be this yes so now a Nigerian police and a police officer the award where corruption Tory give the SP Mike Oboku so say no be all police they corrupt and no be all public officer they pull hand for magu magu I beg me will thank the SP Mike Oboku for showing say Nigerian police get good officers now here. We go end corruption to read today. May we jam again next Sunday. Now me be your Tori Tori master. Marvelous Oboman. Una baba yo.